speaker is Deb Eddy, and her topic is increasing the safety of uh, living kidney donors. So I'm going to talk a little bit about increasing the safety of living kidney donation and what we know about the safety of kidney donation um, in this era. So disclosures, I've got none. Uh, happy to have some, but I don't have any right now. So what are the concerns with living, don um, living kidney donation? Number one, primum non nocere. There are people who really don't believe in living kidney donation because it's unnecessary surgery in some people's eyes for a perfectly healthy individual, but living donation goes far beyond just the surgery. What are our goals? We want to protect the potential donor from physical harm, be it a, you know, future kidney disease, death, uh, complications related to transplant or donation, or psychological injury. injury. The other question really is, does donation of a kidney have an adverse effect on mortality, future risk of end-stage renal disease, pregnancy, or psychological well-being? So between 2010 and 2015, there were a series of papers that came out that did raise some flags, saying perioperative mortality and long-term survival following live kidney donation, long-term risk for kidney donors risk of end-stage renal disease following live kidney donation, and then gestational hypertension and preeclampsia. As someone who does a lot of living donor evaluations and have for several years, I felt a little bit assaulted by this, but it did put up some flags for me. So those of you that know me better than others know that I kind of grew up on racetracks, and my father was a mechanic, a race car mechanic and part-time driver, so I grew up a lot on the tracks. So I knew what a yellow caution flag meant. And that's what these articles that came out did for me. It put up a caution flag. Pay attention. Do we need to slow down and take a look at what we're doing? All these studies were somewhat controversial. Like I said, it did raise a caution flag that we better be looking carefully at what we're doing, even though it seemed to be perfectly safe. And what this has done is made, generated a lot more papers coming out in the literature about living donation. So mortality. What about mortality in living donors? Well, if you look at this, this is a paper put out by Segev, and you'll see many of the papers that came out came out by the same group in different iterations, um, looking at the same database. And what they looked at is, what is the mortality of living donors um, in the first three months post-donation and the first 12 months post-donation? And they compared this to a group of the NHANES National Health and Nutrition Survey Group of people, so they had 80,000 donors in this cohort that started back in 19, I don't remember what the year was, 1964, some, I can't remember the year now, and looked at this and they compared it to the NHANES database. Well, that database only had 20,000 people in it total. And we called the group of NHANES database people down to 9,000 eligible people. They had to do multiple iterations of comparison to make the comparator group of similar size for the live donor group. So what they showed in this was that the rate of mortality per 10,000 donors was about 3.1 as compared to 0.4 in the control group. Well, this is a group of healthy people. What I tell living donors when I'm doing evaluations, this is a group of people that like to be in studies, so they like to make you look good, and they're proud to be in studies. So this is a, a fairly uber-healthy group of people. Then they compared this to the 12-month mortality post-donation and saw that it was not really significantly different. So you can see, I don't know, do I have a pointer? Over, there we go. Over here, you can see that statistically there was no difference at 12 months. But there's a statistically different rate of mortality at the three-month mark. Well, that's not a surprise. These living donors um, went through surgery, whereas the match controls did not. So then the question was, does it matter by era? Were we doing better now? Were we doing better before? Are we getting too cavalier? Um, and we're not. Let me get this out of the way. Um, and if you look at the time in these different eras, the number of deaths really was not statistically significantly different. So there was no difference at three months versus 12 months. The statistic held true. And then when they looked at the overall rate, of mortality, living donors had less mortality than the overall group and lifetime risk. So that was reassuring. 
Well, then I wanted to look and see what is mortality related to other surgeries. And if you look at our mortality at three months, which is 3.1 per 10,000 surgeries, compared to a lap coli, pretty standard surgery, 18 per 10,000, so lap uh, donor nephrectomy is safer. For a non-donor nephrectomy, for non-donation purposes, 260 per 10,000. If you look at elective surgery overall, 17 per 10,000. And for emergent surgery, which of course is a different situation, the mortality rate is 170 per 10,000. So this is a much overall safety, safer procedure than the uh, general surgeries that we're looking at here. Well, what about the risk of end-stage renal disease? This has been the big thing that has got people's attention over time. And this graph got people's attention when this first came out by Mazzali. And this is, again, the SEGGEV group. It's the same group of people using the same cohort for control. And they looked at the risk of end-stage renal disease amongst live donors compared to healthy non-donors and said, well, my gosh, this is going to be a lot greater with about, um, I think there's 25, I can't remember now, 20, uh, several people that went into end-stage renal disease, about 99 over this whole group. And that was different than the non-controls or the, the control group that were non-donors, but they're a different group of people. So what were the causes of ESRD? And if you look at this paper, um, you see who was at greater risk for developing ESRD across all donors, 99 cases, rate of about 30. Younger people, they've got longer time to develop ESRD. Men consistently have a higher rate of developing ESRD than women. And the other thing that always comes up in all studies is African Americans have a higher rate of ESRD. This is really what's raised a lot of flags lately is looking at this risk of blacks in uh, developing ESRD for living donation. Well, what is the estimated lifetime risk? If you take the general population compared to live donors, compared to this cohort of healthy non-donor controls, which is basically the NHANES database, for unscreened populations, about 326 per 10,000. This is much higher than live donors, which is about um, there were 90 people in this group. So this risk is much higher. So we tell donors all the time that your risk is certainly no higher of developing ESRD compared to the general population. If you compare it to this non-healthy, or this healthy group of non-donors, it is higher. But this is not a, a good comparative group, and I'm going to talk about that at the end. So what are the causes? Well, same thing as many other causes of ESRD. Diabetes hypertension, and occasionally GN. Those people that developed a glomerulonephritis post-donation tend to do it early in the first 10 years, which probably means it was not picked up at the time of donation. And over time, you can see diabetes is more likely to happen over time. Hypertension is more likely to happen over time. And this raises the question about whether or not these donors were being adequately followed, which we know, and I'll show a slide at the end, Donors don't always get the follow-up that they need. We follow donors six months, uh, one year, and two years by UNOS mandate that we have to follow up on these donors. But historically, that has not always been the case. Trying to herd donors is like herding cats. You can't find them. Even when we know where, where they are, we can't get them to respond because they're living their life. So one thing to keep in mind is what, what the uh, comparison groups are. And did these people get follow-up? Keep in mind that none of these studies are prospective, except for one Minnesota study that I'll show you, where they're being followed prospectively on a regular basis. What's happening is that these people get don they donate, then they get followed up maybe once or twice early on, except now with UNOS, we try and capture data at two years. And then we see, OK, who developed end-stage real disease? Who, de who died? And we're looking at things like the Social Security Death Index, we're looking at the USRDS database, and we're looking at snapshots. We have no idea what happened in between. So this study actually was not part of the SEGEV study. This was a group out of um, Virginia that looked at what are the causes and associations with developing ESRD. And what was really striking in this study is the risk of ESRD amongst identical twin donors. And we think these are great for the recipients. Who wouldn't want an identical twin to donate? You don't need immunosuppression. 
but when they looked at those who developed ESRD, identical twins were far more likely to develop ESRD than any other population. And again, what else stands out here are the African Americans as opposed to whites. Socioeconomic status didn't seem to make a difference. And up here, uh, this is relatives who have a greater risk, and especially identical twins. And the other thing is, again, males have a greater risk of developing ESRD as opposed to women. So we have to pay attention to the men. One thing, and nobody comments on this um, with any detail because nobody knows why do men have this uh, greater propensity, is one, they don't follow up as well. And I tell donors this all the time. Women show up. We've got mammograms and paps and all these other things that we have to show up for. Men are not great about showing up to the doctor unless they have a problem. And by the time they have a problem, it may be a bit late, whereas women are much more likely to show up. And that's been shown in a paper, um, actually, that I did probably in 2013 that looked at women versus men in transplantation. The same paper out of Virginia looked at, is there a breakdown by age and other factors about who's most likely to develop ESRD? And you can see that early on, at the five-year mark, there's not a big risk for anybody. But when you get out to the 20-year mark, who's at greatest risk are young African Americans who donated. They have a much, much more significant risk of developing ASRD. The other group that gets your attention is older white people. So young black people, and I'll talk a little bit about what that may be about, versus older white people are the ones that are most likely to develop ESRD. So we've got to pay attention to the risk factors associated with these people. So with the African Americans, APOL1 has become really a hot topic. Across the country, some centers screen for APOL1 and all African American donors. The problem is we don't know what to do with the data. And the pros are, well, do potential donors have the right to know if they have high-risk variant for this APOL1 gene? And what do we do with it, and what do they do with it? Are they more likely to donate? Are we less likely to accept them? Because the data is not that strong, we're not really sure what to do with it. So we do not screen at our center. Um, if individuals have low risk or the, uh, the lower risk or one variant of the, the higher risk, are they going to feel better about donating? Are they going to feel more secure? Are they going to feel less secure? So because we don't know what to do with the data, we don't screen for it. Um, there is a study trying to get funded right now called the Apollo study that's going to be looking at the association of APOL1 in both recipients and donors. Um, I don't know where that's going because it's still in the developmental phase. Well, Doshi, who is also part of the SIGEV group, looked at 136 African American versus 115 controls. This is small numbers, but African Americans are not the most likely to donate. And they looked at, does the high-risk genotype, is that associated with a lower um, or higher risk of ESRD? Well, it did show that the EGFR was lower for high-risk variant donors, both pre- and post-transplant, but the rate of decline in renal function was no different. So their conclusion was that the live donation uh, for people who have two high-risk variants, they may have a lower GFR, but the rate and risk of developing ESRD did not seem to be greater. So it's, again, very controversial. They did have a lower um, GFR. They had a higher creatinine. But the data is still out on what we do with this. So we do not check it. And on occasion, if we have a lot of concern about a very young African-American donor, we have checked it in a couple patients. But it's not part of our routine. What about hypertension? Arndt Mattis published a review on looking at what are the risks of developing complications after live donation. And i got to say, the Minnesota group has a really nice database with over 4,400 patients in it, with results dating back to 1963 when they started their data. Um, they have prospectively, this is sort of like a researcher's dream, they have prospectively checked results and seen these donors at six months, one year, two years, three years, and then every three years thereafter. So they have the perfect sort of data. They've got the prospective data that nobody else does. So he, uh, he published this data and looked at what are the risks of developing hypertension down the road. And these are the pre-donation risk factors. So that can we look at this to try and decide maybe who should 
be more carefully counseled before donating. And those people that had hypertension pre, hyperlipidemia pre, are more likely to develop hypertension later. If they had higher diastolic blood pressure, smoking, we don't take any donors who smoke, they have to quit and hopefully stay quitting, or if they had a lower GFR. So these are the factors that go into uh, predicting what the risk is of developing hypertension down the road. And again, in this group, they were able to follow their donors, so they know. And if you can pick up on hypertension in donors and intervene, you're less likely to develop ESRD. And they had a very low risk rate of less than 1% of ESRD in their donor population. And I think a lot of it may be because they follow them so carefully. What about diabetes? This is the same scenario. What are the risk factors that will predict developing diabetes post-donation? These are not rocket science here. Higher BMI, more likely to develop diabetes down the road. Women, on the cusp of, of being at higher risk. Um, and, those are, and then uh, fasting blood glucose, blood glucose being elevated at the time of, elevation, or of a donation. We look at all of this and we calculate what the diabetes risk score is for all donors. Uh, we do uh, fasting and two-hour blood glucoses in appropriate people, and we look at hemoglobin A1Cs. And if people have a high risk and they're young of developing diabetes, we would not let them donate. If they're older, the chance of them getting into trouble, and define older, 50, 60, um, if they, which is hard to grasp with right now, but. Um, those people who have a higher risk, but they're already 60 years old, what's the chance of them getting into lifetime risk problems from diabetes with respect to kidney disease? It's, it's pretty low. So we're more likely to let them go and be a donor. But if they're young, we're not going to let them donate. What about obesity? This has been a quandary and been a, a topic of controversy uh, for quite a while. Jamie Locke down at UAB looked at what the risk is of developing ESRD amongst obese donors. They defined obese by the standard criteria of being a BMI greater than 30, um, which we let people go up to 34. And they looked at that risk. Those people who had a BMI of greater than 30 at 30 years had a threefold increased risk of developing ESRD. Uh, we encourage people to get their BMIs down below 35. Um, Anna Marie, who's here, can tell us that these people lose the weight, but unfortunately, sometimes they gain it back, and so we have to be careful with that. She also did a hazard analysis to look at what are the risks of developing ESRD, uh, what other factors, and again, what shows up is not only obesity, but again, the African-American right here, which I can't see through the plant, but uh, African-Americans, again, have this increased risk, and they would have a large, larger African-American population down at UAB. What about pregnancy concerns? It's, this is a really interesting topic because we tell donors that we would like them to wait two years after donation to before conception. I'm not exactly sure where that came from, but that's been our practice. Um, and in this study that was put out by Garg in the New England Journal of Medicine, they looked at a Canadian cohort, and they too used the two-year cutoff of what the risks were to, for developing complications of gestational hypertension or preeclampsia slash eclampsia. And they too use this two-year cutoff of pregnancy within the first two years after donation. And I looked at their paper trying to figure out, well, where did you come up with that? And they, it's again, this general belief that that's what the, the risk is. Um, so what they looked at was uh, pregnancies in donors versus non-donors and what the risk is of preeclampsia or gestational hypertension. And you can see that there's statistical significant difference between donors and non-donors in developing hypertension. But the one thing that came out in this when I looked at his data more carefully is that the biggest factor that determines this is not whether or not they're two years or less for out from donation, though there is, um, this is greater than two years, but it's age. And that's no surprise either because that's what's true in the general population. U.S. tends to use age 35 as a cutoff. We're considered, that was a little offensive too, for two of my pregnancies being beyond age 35. But you know, being a geriatric mother at age 35 or greater, can, the Canadian study used greater than uh, 32 years of age. And those people that were over 32 had a higher risk of gestational hypertension or diabetes. So it's not entirely clear how much of this is attributed to 
donation, but there certainly is an association. So we do not tell people they should not get pregnant. In fact, I'm not sure we should be telling people that they necessarily have to donate and then wait for pregnancy later. Or, um, so we'll go ahead and let people donate. We have concerns. We want them to be advised. I tell people in general there's about a 20% increased risk of developing gestational hypertension or, or preeclampsia, which seems to be what's come out of the Norwegian study and this study as well. So what about psychosocial well-being? Um, we have every donor sees our independent living donor advocate. And if we have any concerns about their psychosocial status, if they've had a history of depression, there's a sense that they do not cope well with stress or things not going well, that they might even see a psychiatrist. But again, Mattis went through their data, which is prospective, and looked at what are the factors that are associated with developing um, psychosocial stresses post-donation. And again, it's how did the course of the transplant go? You know, was there some problems post-donation? Obesity, a history of psychiatric difficulties. Again, if we know that they started out with them, there's a good chance that they may flare post-donation. Um, longer recovery time, younger age at the time of donation, i.e., did they really understand what they were getting into? Um, heavier financial burden, burden, which is not a surprise or this feeling of moral obligation to donate, which we really try to sort out at the time of, don of evaluation for donors, is how pressured are they feeling? You know, we do not want people coming into this feeling that they are obligated or need to donate. This needs to be a free will. I'll comment on these living donor outcomes. Nobody is cavalier about living donors. This is a tremendous gift, and we really greatly take this um, seriously, that we need to protect these donors but at the same time, they, do need, they have some autonomy. The, after all these studies are looked at carefully, the absolute risk of a, an event, especially ESRD, is still very low. And many of these papers emphasize the relative risk, but what we really have to look at is what is the absolute risk, which is low. The population studies are plagued by suboptimal control groups. None of these groups have a good control group. None of these studies have a good control group. Uh, an unscreened population-based comparison may underestimate the risk in donors. A selected healthy non-donor group, such as the N. Haynes group, that is uh, reused multiple times, sometimes up to eight times for one uh, person in the N. Haynes group being a comparator for a donor, may overestimate the risk in donors. The, again, the N. Haynes group had multiple sample um, and tend to be younger population, was not the same era. The population was more educated. There were more women. It was a higher Caucasian ratio. And there were fewer smokers in the NHAIDS group than there were in the general population uh, of living donors. So, so all these things need to be taken into consideration when you read these papers, that it's not as clear as it, it may seem. So none of the studies are prospective. The only prospective data is the Mattis data out of uh, University of Minnesota. So what do we do? We do a very thorough medical evaluation. The ultimate goal is to rule out donors with conditions that may put them at increased risk of ESRD, such as hypertension, which is, of course, age dependent. If you're over 50, we'll let people go through as long as they don't have end organ damage. Uh, we'll do echocardiogram, eye exam, and look at their urine microalbumin. Um, we look at disease associated with the ESRD. Do they have we have people, believe me, Helen's in the audience. We look at health history questionnaires for people that have all kinds of things that would be associated with ESRD, overt diabetics, frank hypertension, lupus, all kinds of uh, other autoimmune diseases. Conditions that put the donor at increased risk of complications in the perioperative period, severe asthma, uh, known coronary artery disease, they're not gonna donate, and significant obesity. So what's our process? They get the health history questionnaire, reviewed by the intake nurse, which is Helen, myself, and uh, or Brian Lee when he's here, or a nurse practitioner, Anna Marie Torres. And if that looks good, they can go on to donor workup one, which where they get labs, which are again reviewed by MDNP, and look for hypertension or abnormal lab results, they might get ruled out. Or they move on to donor workup two at which time they're scheduled to be seen by nephrologist, 
and a surgeon, the independent living donor advocate. They get their CT scan, EKG, chest X-ray, and they may get ruled out, or they may move on to selection, where we discuss them and hopefully get them passed on to be able to be scheduled for surgery, or if there are concerns by the group, they may get ruled out. And then they either get scheduled for surgery or enter the National Kidney Registry, which you heard a little bit about. So here's our data on living donor follow-up. I mentioned that UNOS requires, as of about 2010 or 11, requires that we follow up all donors at six months, one year, and two years. And we collect clinical data, which is predominantly weight and blood pressure, and we're doing pretty good. The red bar is what UNOS requires, and we, we're getting this. We're doing pretty well on collecting it at six months, one year, stretching a little bit at two years, but we're, doing, we're meeting our mark. And then there's the lab data, which we're not doing such a great job at, but we're trying, and we're not doing any worse than national average. So we look at six-month lab data, which is basically urine protein and creatinine, one-year data, and did I mention that trying to track down donors is like herding cats? It's a little bit hard to collect some of this data. Um, every center in the country struggles with how to collect, collect this data. I think the University of Minnesota is the only center I know that's actually doing a great job at this. So this is uh, tough to get, but it's important data. So what's the future hold for this? There are several proposals out there, two are European and one is US, of how to follow up living kidney donors. Um, Germany has a study of a short-term follow-up for 12 months. We really need 20-year data. Um, they're only looking at EGFR and quality of life. There's a Dutch trial, and the Dutch put out a lot of the studies on living donors. Um, but again, the one thing I always say about European data is that it's European data. They have a different lifestyle. They have different, um, more homogeneity of ethnicity in Northern Europe. They have a different lifestyle in that they tend to exercise more. They tend not to be as obese a society as the US. So their data is not always as comparable to us as we would like. Um, they're going to look at long-term follow-up of donors and compare it to their control population. And then they're also going to look at psychological outcomes. Lastly, Bert Kaziski has a proposal out there that they were asked by HRSA uh, asked the SRTR to establish a registry of living donors. We've only been, I've been in this field for 22 years, and we've been asking and begging for this for 22 years. And now HRSA kind of said, oh, you guys should be following donors. Hello. Yes, we should. So Bert Kaziski, who is very much involved with the SRTR as they're running it now, um, has put together a cohort of about, I think it's about nine centers right now. We're not part of it. And they're looking at establishing some mechanism for being able to follow uh, donors long term. And they're looking at the feasibility. Um, they're moving on um, here into looking at how to logistically make this happen. And then hopefully we'll be implementing this. Their hope is to be able to take this nationwide, but we'll see how the preliminary study goes. Um, and I think that's all I got. So I'm happy to take questions about living donors. Um, it's a very controversial field. We're very cautious with our donors. We are seeing several donors um, a week now and getting ready to you know, see five or six donors, and we should be able to do a lot more living donor transplantation, but we are exceptionally cautious about them. Any questions? No? We don't. I mean, it really depends on what the ESRD f is from. If they have GN, I would, after seeing, looking at this data, because I'd never seen that before, I would take caution if it was a glomerular nephritis and look carefully in that donor if they had any kind of evidence of that. But no, we're not excluding identical twins. I wish we had more of them. So from the devil's uh, perspective, what is the rebuttal to the proposition that uh, donor surgery is needless? That donor surgery is what? Needless surgery. Well, uh, well, there are people that do firmly believe that, um, but then there is benefit beyond to the donor. So how do you counter something like this is needless surgery with, but I want to help my child. They're going to wait eight years, or I want to help my spouse who will likely die on dialysis if, if I can't. The benefit to that donor
is potentially greater than the risk to that donor. And so that's, the, you've got to provide them with some autonomy. And, but it, you know, there are people that don't believe in it, and I know surgeons that don't believe in it, and they're not expected to do it. If you don't embrace it, you don't have to do it. So I think it's all in, in consent. <laughs> Good. So there's two studies that we're involved with right now. It's a great question. So some of our internal people, I don't know if Elaine Koo's here, she's trying to look at, at those people who, two different groups, those people who apply to be living donors and either get rejected, because there is data out there showing that that is actually psychologically challenging for these donors when they get turned down. And because we have a electronic medical system where they apply electronically and it's an automatic, um, we don't necessarily have good follow-up on those automatic turndowns. But those people who, there's two things we need to look at. Those people who apply and don't proceed with the donor workup, those people who apply and get accepted and then somebody else donates for them, um, and then those people who apply and just never really complete the workup, that's a huge group. I think last time I looked, we've got 1,300. I can't remember what the number is. We've got a lot of donors sitting in the queue that did a little bit, but never really followed up. So again, what was your exact question? The question is the impact of being rejected, that the psychological trauma and the, all these bad things we expected really happened to Right, and, and that is exactly um, one of the things that we want to look at. Uh, there's a researcher named Amy Waterman who's down at UCLA that I'm working with who is really trying to get a handle on this as well, that what happens to those people that want to donate, you know, maybe they're a little borderline, you know, is, which is harder for them, and especially depending on age. You know, it's, it's hard if you can't help your child, you can't help your spouse, you can't you know, help your family member. Um, there is a little bit of data on, on how challenging that is for people. And are we being too paternalistic? But, you, you know, it's, it's a fine line. Peter. <laughs> yeah, go, you've done it before. <laughs> if, you're, if you're going to, um, it, you, what patients always ask us is, what would you do if this was your daughter? Mm -hmm. um, uh, if you have a, uh, not an uncommon scenario of a 20, 20 year old, 20 to 25 year old uh, black woman who wants to give to her grandfather who's 70 years old. Um, what do you say? If, if they ask you the question, what would you say to your own daughter? So if I've got a young black woman, here's what I've done recently, and I didn't pull this, this one up. There is a, a risk of ESRD calculator that I use on every donor that I do now, and I look at the 15-year risk and the lifetime risk. A young black woman, say that she's 20 years old, her risk is probably going to be about 2% lifetime risk for ESRD. And so I had this recently with a young black woman who was 25, wanted to donate to mom who was 65. She had just had a baby um, and had a long conversation with her about you are at likely at increased risk. I look at the family history. And if they have a lot of family members with hypertension, ESRD, I, I counsel them that this is significantly concerning. Um, sometimes we, they don't get past selection. So it really depends on what, what their whole family history looks like. You know, the African-American thing always throws it off worse. If it's somebody that's white or Latino and not obese, that's not as concerning. But the African-American... Um, aspect of it is raising more flags. Uh, what's the policy for what? Transplantation for donors who develop ESRD. Yes, ESRD. They still get priority listing with UNOS. So the question is, what is the policy, and it's a UNOS policy, for donors who develop ESRD post-donation? And so they get, uh, under the current KAS, the kidney allocation system, there's a four-sequence run. 
and all people who developed ESRD as a result of donation, or maybe not as a result, but um, contemporary to donation, they get priority listing with UNO, so they get high, high points listing. Is it more than four points? Do they get all the way? So it's like being sensitized. All the way. So they get like being sensitized. So they get 200, 200 202 points. So they do get high listing. a protein restricted diet and you also encourage them in light of the uh, current GN JNC recommendations that they should not accept for themselves average blood pressure control but perhaps you put in the group of lower blood pressure as being acceptable. Okay, so I don't, that, he had a pretty good voice. So the question was, what do we counsel donors about uh, protein intake and blood pressure control? So for protein intake, I don't think we're consistent about it. What we see the most is these young strapping men who are gym rats and taking protein supplements. Um, I counsel them to eat no more than a 1.5 gram per kilogram protein diet. Um, so not the high protein diet because a lot of those protein supplements will put them into over two grams per kilo. Um, so we do counsel them to restrict their protein to something reasonable in the 1.2 to 1.5 gram per kilo. For blood pressure control, we don't give them specific instructions, but they should follow. And then we've had a lot of conversation about the new JNC criteria of whether or not we should follow the new ones, the old ones. We're still sticking to the old ones, but tell them that they need to monitor their blood pressure and that should they develop blood pressure greater than 140 over 90, which probably should be 130 over 80, that they should be treated early and often. Okay. Great, thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Debbie.